monthly webinar. Uh, today, uh, our topic is failure to rescue, bedside patient rescue, a great opportunity. Uh, I'm Charles Denham, and for those of you that don't, don't have the slide or do have the slides, I'm on slide two, and we'll just uh, cover a couple of housekeeping details here to begin with. We just want to uh, draw your attention to turn your volume up on your computer as high as it'll go and make sure that you're getting good volume. And if you're not, and I'm on slide four, you can go up to the participants icon, click on it, and then click on the little telephone icon at the bottom left corner of your screen, and that'll give you a direct line. I'm on slide five, and for those of you that don't have the slides yet, you can uh, go to uh, uh, www.safetyleaders.org, and in the upper right quadrant of the screen of the landing page, click on What's New, and then you can click on this webinar for April 20th, and it'll take you to a landing page that will allow you to download the slides, future resources, and come back and watch it on demand. And that's on slide six for those of you that are, have the slides. Um, Slide seven, our coordinates for, for social media are on slide seven. Slide eight is our purpose statement, and we, uh, our purpose is that we will measure our success by how we protect and enrich the lives of families, patients, and caregivers. And this is such a critical issue regarding this topic at hand that we really address failure to rescue and not only the first victims but the second victims when, um, when we have... Uh, situations where we haven't rescued a patient because there are more than just the family and the patient that uh, has not been rescued, but also our caregivers. And our mission is to accelerate performance solutions that save lives, save money, and create value in the communities we serve. Our disclosure statement that we have, uh, uh, we will not be talking about products and services, uh, pharmaceuticals or devices that are for sale uh, at all, but you can read our entire disclosure statement. And then on slide 10, uh, you'll see our speakers and reactors. We have Dr. Gene Huddleston and Dr. Santiago Romero Rufo, uh, 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 Dr. Greg Boats, uh, Jennifer Dingman, uh, and uh, myself. Uh, today, we'd like to turn uh, the mic over to Jennifer Dingman and have Jennifer uh, set our course for us, uh, uh, representing the patients and the families that we serve. Jennifer, uh, and Jennifer is uh, uh, a longstanding patient advocate, a published author, contributed to national standards, has been served on government committees, and is a, a steadfast supporter of uh, the work. And I know she's enthusiastic and excited about this particular topic. Jennifer? Thank you, Dr. Denham. <clears throat> I just want to thank everyone for being here today. This, this topic is very near and dear to my heart because over 20 years ago, failure to rescue is the reason I lost my mother and got me involved with patient safety to begin with. Very excited about our speakers. They're wonderful, and, and you're going to learn so much. And I encourage you to please share this with your colleagues and spread this wonderful news that we're doing great things to protect patients in health care in the United States. Um, I'll turn it back to you, Dr. Denham. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. I know you're not feeling that well, and it's just great that uh, you always step up to support uh, and be such a great patient advocate. Um, uh, I just like I'm on slide 12. I'm going to take you through a rapid fire sort of review of some things that are in the news and some of our survey highlights that really draw our attention to this topic. And I'm on slide uh, 13 now. Uh, and uh, from Scientific American, uh, it addresses it's, it, it, the title is it's time to get uh, get a, a better accounting of what kills us. And so even in Scientific American, they're addressing uh, the frequency of patient safety issues. And so as you give your briefings and, and give your presentations in patient safety, here's another citation for you addressing the, this that is now described uh, the third leading cause of death. Um, then in U.S. Uh, news, a national survey of over 2,000 adults were surveyed regarding uh, their children and, and, and 542 who were parents of a child under 18. And nearly 40% of those said they were 
somewhat concerned that their child might be injured during a hospital stay or get sick due to medication errors that are made by medical staff members. And as you know, U.S. News and World Report has uh, really championed the cause for quality in health care, and they're continuing to focus on this area. Fifty-three percent say they're concerned uh, about their kids developing infections, and in the article it addresses the 1 in 25 patients we care for that get an infection that we give them. Uh, on March 15th, an article came out regarding health information technology and ad addressed this issue uh, uh, of, uh, that, that, that uh, surfaced in a, pen, a report in Pennsylvania and that uh, HIT-related errors uh, occurred during every step of the medication use process uh, and that a majority of the errors reached patients. And so we have to keep vigilant. Uh, there are a lot of new topics in patient safety, but these related to medication management, which we've worked on for so many years, continue to be a daunting challenge, especially when it relates to IT. Dr. Greg Boats is going to react for us today, and I've asked him to react regarding this issue that, that is important for us to recognize, and that 30% of prescription opioid deaths uh, are related to not only the opioids but the benzodiazepines such as Xanax and Valium and that the number of prescriptions has gone up, you see further down uh, on the slide, uh, from 2001 to 2013 has gone from 9% to 17% of both being, uh, prescriptions being filled. And the statement is made from a Stanford study that 15%, they might, there would be a 15% reduction in overdoses that result in hospitalizations if we didn't prescribe them both simultaneously. And this has kind of been, uh, you know, more in the news here uh, of late. Also uh, uh, on slide uh, 17, um, uh, uh, the naloxone reversal agent for opioid and, her and heroin overdose uh, increasingly becoming available. And I found it really surprising in this article that Utah ranks the seventh highest in the U.S. for the rate of opioid overdose deaths. And so uh, we continue to see this being available. Uh, the, on slide number 18, this is really kind of an early warning for our senior leaders who uh, sometimes the legal and risk management folks want to insulate the senior leaders from risks of those they serve and those who serve in their organizations. And the Penn State uh, uh, issue and the Sandusky uh, abuse case uh, uh, popped up, and one of our leaders of security and, and safety and one of our leading organizations in the country uh, drew our attention to this. And, and, and I think that the, the, the news here is senior leaders, presidents, CEOs, the C-suite and the board are, will be increasingly at risk for criminal uh, 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 criminal penalties uh, for allowing harm to continue. Now, clearly, uh, the abuse that happened to children is not patient, are not patient safety issues, but uh, this is uh, this is uh, going to be a trend of an increasing amount of accountability to senior leaders that uh, allow risks to continue. And uh, as the curtain comes back on accountability and more CEOs end up in orange jumpsuits, I think you're going to see some attention from the C-suite, and there'll be less insulation of, uh, of them from the patient safety issues. Um, then NPR uh, uh, reported uh, on the National Academy of Science report that just came out regarding uh, research, integrity and research. And so in the last six months, we've seen an enormous number of uh, papers regarding uh, professional identity harm, uh, uh, corruption, uh, retractions in journals, and this, are, this uh, National Academy of Science report came out, for those of you that are, that are doing R&D, uh, uh, recognizing an enormous epidemic of improper conduct by uh, researchers. So uh, the misconduct definitions of uh, misconduct, fabrication, falsification, plagiarism, uh, are there, but also the incidents, uh, and, and, and this is enormous, that two-thirds of the retractions of, uh, in the peer review literature are not just due to error, but two-thirds are due to fabrication, falsification, or plagiarism. And so we're seeing this enormous uh, trend uh, developing, and even those at the National Academy of Sciences, because of this report, are recommending getting out ahead uh, of this. On slide 21, uh, they address the cascading damage to the system 
uh, when we have uh, these flaws in integrity. And I think these come right back to what uh, uh, we're seeing uh, kind of across the board in healthcare and uh, the weaponization of the Internet of sharing information, and information can be ter- used for good and it can be used for bad. Uh, last month we addressed, in the last few months, we addressed the top ten safety concerns for healthcare organizations. And this has been picked up by the press uh, in, in, in an incredible way. You'll see article after article after article coming back to EHRs, CPOE-related re- re- uh, uh, medication errors, uh, and you saw in that earlier article regarding the, the breakdowns and that there were uh, breakdowns in every step of the medication use process and that the majority of the errors were getting to patients. Uh, number one in ECRI's top ten were uh, uh, EHRs. And then number two, and that sets us up for today's discussion, unrecognized patient deterioration, the number two top patient safety concern. And you see the rest, including number seven, opioid uh, overdoses, and we'll definitely have our leaders come back to talk to us about what's up in anticoagulation in the next couple of months and as that popped up. Now, what we did was after we showed this to you in the last webinar, we asked the polling question, I am interested in the ECRI patient safety concerns for 2017, and we got a, which is an amazing response from you. 67% of you said gave it a 10. 92% agreed, 77% strongly agreed, and about 8% of you were neutral. So we are definitely going to tackle these issues, not all at the same time, but maybe two at a time, because they are so absolutely critical. Um, we gave you a free text entry. I'm not going to read it, but you have it there for your notes. ECRI, patient safety concern, concern topics you'd like us to address, and you can see multiple times EHR. Um, we see uh, healthcare violence popped up and restraints a number of other uh, uh, issues as well. And uh, then what we did, and, and this foreshadows uh, Dr. Huddleston's great uh, uh, contribution to our webinar series over the last year, and she'll be uh, giving us some introductory thoughts before helping us dive into uh, the uh, uh, topic of failure to rescue, but uh, this issue of omission versus commission. So we pulled you last, uh, last month, and we said, I am interested in failure to rescue performance improvement topics, and look what you gave us. And so as a response to your, your, the polling survey last month, 64% of you gave it a 10, 95% agreed, uh, 81% strongly agreed, gave us a 9 and a 10. And so that is why we're responding with today's webinar, because you responded so, uh, uh, so terrifically. And we can come back to this slide dur- during our reactor panel uh, uh, series, but you gave us some free text entry areas. Uh, sepsis came up a number of times, uh, and best strategies uh, uh, for rescue. Uh, we we asked you uh, whether you're interested in triage and misdiagnosis, and we're going to ask you again about triage because we think that may be the next topic you might want to to uh, to, to answer next next month. Uh, uh, but uh, you gave us 63 percent of you gave that a 10 that you really want these areas of omission. And so these are the next topics, uh, in addition to the ECRI topics that we'll tackle. But you can see that, uh, uh, that you, there's a pretty unified support for wanting to know more about triage and misdiagnosis. We also ask you to give us free text entry, and you can see sepsis popped up a number of times. Uh, stroke uh, is there, uh, and care in the ED. We also talked about high-impact uh, hazards to patients, uh, students, and employees uh, with the MedTAC program and uh, the high-impact care hazards and lifeline behaviors. And we talked about this after-school program that we helped get started, and we're so delighted to announce that in the first 10 weeks of an after-school program with only 17 students that one life has already been saved, and uh, a great contribution by Dr. Dr. Boats. You see that the, uh, e- the, the WebEx has kind of moved the, the, the red triangle around what should be around uh, pre-hospital bystander and hospital definitive care, and uh, uh, we'll go ahead and fix that for the final slide sets that you can, uh, you can uh, uh, download. Now, in follow-up to that, on Easter morning uh, at the, in the L.A. Times, uh, you can now see a groundswell, uh, and, and this was a highlighted article, uh, regarding Stop the Bleed. Now, they didn't talk about the Stop the Bleed program we did in the MedTAC program, but they really addressed this issue uh, of using tourniquets. And the quote here is, whether there's a vehicle attack in Sweden, Egypt, 
a shooting in San Bernardino, um, that the civilians are always there first. It's just a matter of time before it happens again. And uh, we have found third graders to fifth graders can adequately learn how to use uh, tourniquets and pressure bandages. We ask, the, we ask you all would you, were you interested in a MedTech program in your community, and uh, we are going to reach out to everyone, but specifically reach out to the 32% of you that said you wanted to p potentially start a program in your community. We ask you about free text entry questions. Again, I won't read it to you, but you can see the common issues that popped up. Uh, sudden cardiac arrest, how to work with EMS, uh, opioid issues, workplace violence again popped up. So it's really my great pleasure now, uh, uh, after giving you that quick drive-by of what's been in the news and then what your polling results uh, are, to introduce uh, Dr. Jean Huddleston. And so many of you have uh, given her such high marks through the webinars that we know that you're seeing her again for the second or third time. Some of you are seeing her for the first time. So I just want to draw your attention to the fact that in the last 13 years as a hospitalist in at the Mayo Clinic, that she's conducted this amazing research of sequential uh, evaluations, these uh, mortality review evaluations of every sequential death at the Mayo Clinic over that period of time, and published a, a, an article at the Journal of Patient Safety. Uh, we have watched her terrific work. Uh, she is a hospitalist. She's the past president of the Society of Hospital Medicine, founder of Hospital Medicine, and the program director of the Hospital Medicine Fellowship at the, at the Mayo Clinic. She received her MD in 1993, uh, and but what I think is really exciting is she's she has all the uh, the accolades that you could expect of someone that has done such great work. She was a Harvard Macy Scholar. Uh, however, she's also uh, uh, has uh, uh, received master's degrees in both clinical research and industrial engineering after uh, realizing that measurement was so important, so critically important to the work she was doing and now has started a national collaborative, uh, which we're so blessed to uh, watch uh, grow. And uh, we're so pleased, that Jean, that you will introduce uh, Santiago, and if you would introduce him as well uh, after you uh, give us an introduction and address this issue uh, regarding failure to rescue. Jean? Um, we are going to be sharing with you uh, the second passion of my life after learning from those who come into our hospitals and, and improving organizational performance is getting to the heart of uh, recognizing and rescuing deteriorating patients. As a hospitalist, this is what I do every day, and uh, as an engineer, improving it uh, sort of speaks to the, uh, the core of, of our work at Mayo and the things that we've been able to do. I'm going to take you through uh, the journey of our failure to rescue deaths, our Mayo story, and how we learned about it from mortality review. And then uh, Dr. Santiago Romero Bufra, who is, uh, worked with me for five years and has single-handedly smoothed the transition from research into practice implementation, is going to share that part of the journey with you. All the stories that I tell come from Mayo Clinic and from our story, and the things that I say are actual cases that we've reviewed and the learnings that we've had, and this is just a snapshot of, of who we are as we celebrated our 150th anniversary this last year. And this is the hospital that I'll be sharing stories from and where the, much of the implementation work that Santiago has done uh, is included. This is the article. Uh, that Dr. Denham represented in terms of our 14 years of learning. At the time of the publication, we had about 10 years' worth of learning. And the primary learning in that article and now we will share with you is around the acts of omission, our failure to recognize and rescue and not intervene in a timely fashion. Our mortality review work that you've heard a lot about in the last several months was because we weren't getting the learning that we needed, actionable information, meaningful information to influence and inspire our leaders to make change. And so we created this charge in 2004, and I just wanted to remind you that the charge was primarily around number one, and the whole mortality review process was around creating a meaningful mechanism to review deaths. Meaningful, we described as thoroughly understandable, measurable, and improvable. And that's what our bedside patient rescue initiative became. We understood what was going on because of mortality review. We measured it and we improved it. And this is the whole circle of that life. Our mortality review initiative and the reason we are able to measure and understand and improve and learn is because we moved away from the concept of peer review 
where a problem is identified or reported, it's reviewed and discussed by peers, same peers, no nurses, no anybody else in a quiet room someplace. Maybe the individual gets a chance to contribute to the conversation, maybe not. Ultimately, they're informed of what the discussion entails, what the punishment might be, so to speak, or what their improvements might need to be, and then it stops. Nothing goes any further than that. And what we're interested in doing is creating a safety learning system, which is the collaborative that we've taken forward, where the patient is reviewed because they're a member of a cohort of interest, whether it's mortalities you're trying to improve, or failure to rescue deaths you're trying to improve, or sepsis, or readmissions, or whatever it is. You take 100 of those cases and you review them so that you can learn, and that learning takes place through a multidisciplinary, multi-specialty approach where it's discussed as a larger group, opportunities are identified, and the learning is shared broadly. And that's the difference between peer review and what we're doing and the fundamental reason why we believe that we've been able to make these changes. This omission thing is a really big deal and where the Bedside Patient Rescue Initiative came from, if you look to the left side of this Pareto diagram, delayed or misdiagnoses and Failure to rescue deaths are our top two things, accounting for more than 45% of our opportunities are just in those two buckets. And you know what? If you delay or miss a diagnosis for long enough, they become a failure to rescue death. So the two are very, very closely intertwined. And that's why we wanted to focus on this particular work. These are just a few examples of the cases that inspired us along the way. This was a 59-year-old female who underwent a total abdominal hysterectomy. For three consecutive days, we missed the abdominal sepsis that was forming her, her infection. She met our RRT criteria for three consecutive days, no antibiotics, no IV fluid boluses. Ultimately, a code was called after the RRT showed up and she was pulseless. On our autopsy, we found that she had a nick small bowel um, when the abdominal hysterectomy was performed. So this is just one example of how we delayed and missed a diagnosis and then it became a failure to rescue death. This is another case of an individual who was in one of our collaborative hospitals, a 56-year-old African-American woman with poor compliance for her diabetes, came into the ambulance, by ambulance to the emergency department and was found to have hyperkalemia. She was treated with the appropriate regimen, but no repeat labs were done, and she ultimately went off to the CT scanner and coded their repeat lab draws showed her potassium was up higher than eight again at that point. Again, or a failure to recognize and rescue uh, death. When we looked at our failure to recognize and rescue death, and this speaks to one of the triage issues, we found that if you were put in the wrong place in our hospital when you first came in, you had a 62-fold increased risk of having a failure to rescue death. But because of the way our systems operated, the timeliness with which people got to the room, no one knew that patient was sick, multiple admissions coming in at the same time, you can hear system issue after system issue after system issue, but ultimately it delayed us getting to the patient in a timely fashion, and they had a 62-fold increased risk of dying. That led us to take our next steps in and to understand that they weren't just sepsis. So we had some failure to rescue deaths around respiratory failure. So our top three diagnoses for failure to rescue deaths, number one now for us is respiratory failure. And these are cases where the patients were getting PCAs post-op and they had undiagnosed obstructive sleep apnea and they died in the first 24 hours after surgery because we didn't catch their respiratory failure. That's our number one. Our number two is sepsis and our number three is exsanguination. Those are the three. So if you just go after sepsis, you're going to miss the others. And we decided that by looking at all causes of deterioration, all of us end up deteriorating with tachypnea, tachycardia, and hypotension. So if we looked regardless of diagnosis, maybe we would catch others. And this is another case of an individual who met our rapid response team criteria for 44 consecutive hours. Now, he was a really, really sick guy. The second vertical line, with the dotted one here, shows that um, a, a really significant change in the patient's uh, hemodynamics, which is accentuated by the point that there's all these extra little dots here that are recorded, and those are the blood pressure and the pulses, and those are nurses who are voluntarily increasing their workload by increasing the frequency of vital sign monitoring without actually being ordered to do so, no orders written. So we knew this patient was really sick, yet we didn't act for another 27 hours when they went to the ICU. Now, would that patient have died anyway? 
maybe. They had had a bone marrow transplant. They were super sick. But did we help seal their fate? Did we decrease the perfusion to their brain and their kidneys for 27 consecutive hours? Absolutely. And then so we didn't help this patient survive. And it's looking for those omissions and not, re, not making a, a direct causality to death that allows you to do more learning when you're doing your mortality review. We knew that we had a big problem ahead of us. We had tried to fix this failure to rescue death issue on three or four different times, seeing temporary improvements and then return to baseline. Why? Because the vast majority of what we were doing were quality improvement initiatives related to education and order sets and those sorts of things, and that requires education to get people to continue to use them. And we failed over and over again after we succeeded. So we knew we were going to need to hardwire something. And so we turned to a hybrid version of a healthcare systems engineering with practice, a model, a joint, where we brought together systems engineering researchers and our practitioners. And we formed a six-layer approach. And Santiago is going to take you through part of it. But I'm going to tee it up by actually showing you our first step. Our first step was to understand what the problem was. And it wasn't just educating people to do the right thing, to use the right order set. We had a much deeper, multifaceted problem. So we did a failure mode effect analysis, and I'm not going to take you through this diagram because it's too detailed, but what I want to show is the complexity of what we were facing. We figured out that in a five-minute span of time, from walking in the room, greeting the patient, evaluating, taking vitals, doing a physical exam, talking to them, synthesizing information with what we already knew, leaving the room, documenting and communicating. In that five to ten minute span of time, we could fail in 33 different ways. So unless we were willing to fix some of those failures, we were not going to have a long-standing improvement. We found, going through that process, that once the RRT was called it was a well-oiled machine. You have a group of people who work together every day. They work in the same ICU. They come out to the floor. They have a role. Everyone does what they're supposed to do. It works. It's all the stuff prior to that where we failed. And all those stars and shapes down at the bottom show you that we had six different groups trying to solve this problem when we started. Our first task was to integrate all of them into one thing so that we could actually succeed as an entire organization. And we did a failure, when we did the failure modes effect analysis and understood where the piece were where we were starting to fail was, we had our providers rank the 33 failure modes so that we could get our hands around a meaningfully sized, fixable group. 33, you can't fix 33 things at once, but you might be able to fix somewhere between 5 and 10. So we had all of our providers and all of our hospitals around Rochester, 20 some odd hospitals, rank order those 33 failure modes using RPN scoring. And we had more than 2,000 providers respond. And these were the top five for Mayo Clinic Midwest, so covering Wisconsin, Minnesota, and our Iowa hospitals. Number one is the patient's clinical condition isn't reassessed after an intervention. So they're hypotensive, you give it bolus of fluids, and then there's no vital signs checked for another eight hours or they have a paracentesis large volume to come out and no one rechecks vital signs and they're hypotensive. All of those things intervene, no follow-up. Number two, too many things to do in too short a period of time. This one speaks so loudly to me because of that prior graph that I showed you where the nurses were charting all of those vital signs when they already had too many things to do in too short a period of time. Physician not reviewing nursing notes. This is the only one where our nurses and doctors disagreed about whether or not this was important. Our nurses thought this was very important, and as you can imagine, our doctors didn't think it was. Next is the care team attributes the patient's cause, diagnosis to the wrong cause, with wrong diagnosis. We think we're treating sepsis, but what we have is silent myocardial ischemia. And the last, the top five, is a standard definition of deterioration does not exist. So unless we as an organization were willing to dive into and address each one of these problems, what we actually put in to fix isn't going to work. So we had to address these issues. Now, is every hospital the same? Absolutely not. And so I want to show you we did the same thing in New Zealand, a bunch of hospitals in New Zealand. These were their top five. Navigating the physician team hierarchy. Too many things to do in too short a period of time. Care team openly dismissing patients' concerns. Not calling the RRT because clinical calling thresholds aren't relevant to their patient. And the physician not reviewing the nursing notes. So you can see some things are the same and some things are different. Same thing, Australia. 
several hospitals, probably 15 different hospitals in Australia participated in this. Too many things to do in too short a period of time. Physician not reviewing nursing notes. Care team is at the bedside ordering interventions so the nurse doesn't call the RRT. What we found through our mortality review process in Rochester, this was one of ours as well, is that the nurses will not call the RRT if they like and trust the physician that's at the bedside. They will call the RRT if they don't like or don't trust the doctor that's at the bedside. So they'll do the right thing for a punitive reason, speaks loudly about the cultures that we're facing as we try to fix these problems. Clinical condition not reassessed and calling thresholds not relevant. Again, some things are the same and some things are different. So we had to design a process going forward that met the failure modes of the particular hospital, in which case St. Mary's and Methodist in Rochester. But we had to recognize that if we wanted to diffuse to other hospitals, it was going to have to be flexible and allow for local, local implementation and local culture. So it couldn't be a one-size-fits-all. And that was one of the designed conundrums that we came up with as we tried to figure out how to fix failure to rescue deaths in our hospital. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Romero Brufano, who's worked with me for more than five years. He's currently obtaining his PhD. He did his medical training in Spain and is then at Mayo Clinic doing implementation science work, and this, particularly with this project and now moving on to some other projects. His expertise and passion for the patient is um, unsurmounted by anyone I've ever met. He's going to share with you our journey and what it looked like. It did feel like this little mouse running through all these mouse traps. Santiago? Thank you, Jean. Thank you so much for your kind introduction. And thanks, everyone, for joining us today as I try to guide you through our journey in implementing this project. Um, so we, facing this, this failure most and effect analysis result, we figured that the solution needed to be system-wide, that it needed to, to change the system and change the, the workflow, otherwise it would not uh, stand for a long time. Um, so we thought about it in the same way as when, when they were building the Golden Gate, and I stumbled upon this story uh, recently, and I found I, I think it fits really well with, with our story when we were doing this project and, and with our philosophy. When they were building the Golden Gate, it was a multi-million dollar deaths from workers from, from accidents. And you can see that the safety culture was not uh, top-notch, really. You can see a gentleman there walking without any sort of protection. Um, but then there was the lead architect said, of the project at the time said that was not good enough. So he insisted, and a significant part of the, of the project was building the safety net, uh, that the idea was that it would catch uh, workers that would fall and prevent them from, from dying. So over the course of the project, the net prevented 19 people from falling into the abyss uh, and prevented their deaths. So they, they were known as the halfway to hell club because they had been caught by the safety net uh, when they were on their way to, to dying. So this is a similar approach to, to what we have in terms of it's, it's relatively rare that a patient experiences physiologic deterioration when they're in the hospital. We, we made some measurements, and it's less than 2% of, of patients when they're hospitalized. But when, when it does happen, it tends to be very severe and it has very severe consequences for the patient. So system um, approaches to fixing those can be, can be very useful. So we started our project by looking into what other people had done in this regard and, and looking at the literature to see if there were any people who had developed um, a system of identifying, helping the, the physicians and the nurses identify what patients were going to deteriorate so that we could intervene on, on those patients early. Um, however, we found that although there were some uh, what is known as early warning scores, early warning scores are ways uh, to objectivize a patient's deterioration status 
that it will allow you to determine whether a patient is acutely deteriorating or not. And this is an example of those. This is the, the MUSE, the Modified Early Warning System, which is widely used in the U.S. And the way it works is you have different parameters that are uh, in, the, in the lines there. So the first one is respiratory rate per minute. And then depending on how far away from the normal range the patient's uh, respiratory rate is, the patient would get a certain number of points. So for example, if the patient's respiratory rate was 22, that would fall into the, the two column. So the patient would get two points for that. You do the same for heart rate, systolic drug pressure, consciousness level, temperature, and urine output in the last two hours. And then you, you add all of those points up and you come up with a, with a risk score. That risk score correlates relatively well with, with the risk for the patient to, to be actively deteriorating and to require ICU uh, transfer in the, in the next 24 hours, but not well enough. And this is important because if you want to do a system approach to this and you want to, for example, like we were thinking of automating alerts, um, so having the electronic medical record calculate the risk for, for every patient in the hospital and for those that, that are at a high risk, send an alert to the providers that are taking care of those patients. You need a score that is very accurate. And the ones that we evaluated, the ones that were out there in the literature were just not good enough. They, they had some other utilities because they were easy to calculate and they, they could serve as, as good guides for nursing, uh, particularly younger nurses to learn how to identify those things. But as, a, as an automated alert system, they, would, they were just not good enough. So basically, when, when you're looking at a alert system, what you're trying to balance is two things. You, you want to balance the number of alerts that you're sending and the number of people that are actually deteriorating that you're able to detect. So if your threshold for when you, when you say a patient is deteriorating is too low, you will catch almost all of them, but at the expense that you will fire this alert uh, very often when the patient is not really deteriorating. So you will, you will have a high number of alerts. So those four quadrants, the, the place where you really want to be is on the D uh, region. generating is low so that you don't uh, cause any alarm fatigue for the, the people that are responding to those alerts, which are typically uh, physicians or, or uh, physician assistants. So when we looked at the literature, the ones that were most widely used were the, the ones on the right. Um, and those are all different types of early warning scores. That's why they end with uh, EWS. And you can see that all of them kind of have different different characteristics in terms of the sensitivity and the number of alerts. Some of them have very low number of alerts, but also low sensitivity. And then as you try to increase the sensitivity for some of them, the number of alerts increases uh, exponentially. And when we, when we looked at this, we found this is just not going to work. We're going to either be sending a lot of false alerts so that the, the responders to the alerts are just not going to be listening to those alerts anymore, or we're going to be missing a lot of patients that are really deteriorating. So the, the next step was to try to develop our own early warning score. And we noticed that the, the methods that had been used to develop these early warning scores were not the most, um, the most sophisticated from a statistical point of view. They, they had decided to focus more on having a simple score that was easy for, for people and providers to understand, and that had caused those scores to be less accurate than they could have been. Um, so this is another example of a, of a learning warning score. This is the, the modified early warning score, or MUSE, that I mentioned earlier is widely used in the US. And you can see that if you try to get to a sensitivity that's at least 70%, the number of alerts uh, goes up really, really fast. So for a sensitivity of about 70%, it's that dot in the middle of the, of the figure, the number of alerts per week for every 10 patients is about 15. So you're alerting pretty much once per day for a service of 10, um, actually twice per day for a service of 10, which is 
clearly unsustainable. The goal, as I mentioned, is to be on the lower and right side of that, of that graph, so you can have a high sensitivity with a low number of alerts. So I mentioned earlier that the methods that had been used to develop these were not very sophisticated, so we set up to develop our own using everything that we could, knowing that we would, um, that we would not have to calculate those scores manually, but we're aiming to include those into the EMR so that the calculation was automatic. So we started with every variable that we could possibly think of. We, we used vital signs, laboratory results, urine output, nursing assessments, and medications. Um, and then we put all of them together. We created uh, based on clinical knowledge. So a bunch of physicians sat together in a room and thought, okay, what combination of variables can be predictive of uh, patient deterioration? And we, we tried to have a very inclusive approach, uh, knowing that we would later select those variables that happen to be very predictive based on uh, sophisticated modeling methods. So we, we came up with, I think it was about 70 variables that were a combination of things. Um, one example was shock index, which is widely used, which is heart rate divided by systolic blood pressure. Uh, there's another, the respiratory index that, that we came up with that combines respiratory rate and oxygen saturation in the blood. So we came up with all of those variables and we included those into our database. Uh, our database included uh, two years worth of Mayo Clinic patients, Mayo Clinic inpatients, uh, which was about, um, after exclusions, it, it was about 35,000 records. Uh, of hospitalizations that we had all the data for. And then we put those variables into a machine, machine learning um, algorithm that creates um, a score, and, and it's able to, to capture the nonlinearity of some of these things uh, very well. So I have a, some explanation of what this, how this algorithm works uh, for those of you that like uh, or are interested in modeling methods. Basically, the, the way this does is it sums up a lot of very simple algorithms. Uh, so for the first one, the, the, red, the red one uh, on the left, it, this is a, a very simple example with, and we can imagine that the, that the y axis is risk and the x axis is a certain variable, for example, heart rate. Um, First thing it does is it tries to build one simple uh, threshold for that for that variable, and then how much risk it, it increases. And then you can see it comes up with that line, that uh, black line there. That is a very simple model. And then it calculates how much the reality, um, the real risk of the patient um, deviates from that. That is this error, error residual here and then it tries to model that again. But this time, it doesn't limit itself to using just the one variable, but it uses any variable that is available in the, in the, in the database to model that error residual. And it does that iteratively multiple times until it comes up with, with about 1,000 rules, 1,000 very simple event statements that include um, two or more, uh, at least two variables. And then at the end, the, the machine learning method is able to build a very strong, very robust model that is able to capture the nonlinearity of some of these effects. So once we were done building our very complex uh, model, very accurate model, we try to implement that. And when you're implementing something like that, you need to be cognizant of what the EMR can and cannot do. There are certain things that, for example, there were some variables that were very difficult to, to capture in real time. So we went through the process of uh, working with our programmers from the EMR, the BLAZE is the rule that we use for the, for the EMR, and communication with our data scientists to balance the accuracy of the, of the tool versus the feasibility of putting it into the EMR and the workload that would be required, the programming effort that would be required for that. So we ended up uh, not using medication data because we found that that was not very, very uh, predictive. And, um, and we came up with a score that was feasible to implement. 
So the, the resulting score, when, when we compare it to Muse, which is kind of the most widely used one, uh, Muse has only six variables that I showed earlier versus MICUSE. Uh, MICUSE stands for Mayo Clinic Early Warning Score, which is the one that we developed. has about 60 data elements, um, kind of those, those primary elements that we, that we discussed, vital signs, labs, uh, nursing assessment, and so on. Uh, it also includes about 60 interaction terms that I mentioned before versus new that has no interaction terms. And then some of our interaction terms also include variables over time. So for example, um, a systolic blood pressure is predicted by itself, the latest one that you have, but it's very different if a patient has uh, a resting or a baseline systolic blood pressure of 160, and then it drops to 120. That systolic blood pressure of 120 wouldn't be uh, worrisome in a in a, in a patient generally, but in this patient, that means that it has dropped 40 milligrams of mercury. That is a very significant drop in blood pressure. So for that patient in particular, that is very uh, worrisome, and it's quite predictive of deterioration that something something is is going on, maybe some type of shock. So our model does include those those variables, and those are quite predictive. Some of the top variables that we have. Are, are in that. Uh, so here are the, the top 20 variables. The model, as I mentioned, includes about 120 variables in total. Uh, but these are the ones that are the most predictive. So you can see the, the top one is the Kirkland probability that is, that is here that was uh, published by Dr. Kirkland here from Mayo as well. And it includes the shock index that I mentioned before, the Braden, which is a measure of um, patient frailty. We, we use it as surrogate for patient frailty. Uh, respiratory rate, SPO2, uh, the, the respiratory index is also here, and the range of heart rate in the, in the last 24 hours, so how much variation there has been in the heart rate of the patient in the last 24 hours. So all of those variables uh, are the, the most predictive ones for, for detecting physiologic iteration. That, as Dr. Halston mentioned earlier, uh, is not just focused on sepsis, it's uh, and the most common ones that we detect are shock of, of any sort, uh, sepsis being the most prominent one, or respiratory failure. And then we, we thought that there was some keys missing. So when we looked at the number of alerts that would have been generated if we had used the calling criteria for the rapid response team, we found that the number of calls to the rapid response team, if those criteria had been applied strictly, would have been enormous, would have been completely unsustainable. But we were not seeing those super high numbers. Uh, so we were thinking, why would that be? And the answer was that it was probably because people were thinking before they were applying the criteria strictly. Um, so even though we do want people to consider those criteria and, and kind of pull the trigger as soon as they have the, the a suspicion. The truth is that if you apply some of those criteria very strictly, there's a lot of patients that meet those criteria that uh, would mean that you should call the RT, when in reality, if you called it for every every single time, you, you would get a number of errors that would be unsustainable. So we were thinking there is some cognition piece here that is going on from the frontline staff, uh, mostly nurses that are the ones that most frequently call the rapid response team that is detecting and deciding what patients are really deteriorating or not. Uh, so we call that the, the worry factor, um, and then we had to rename that the factors for, for, for legal reasons. Um, and we were trying to capture that. We were trying to capture the nurse's sense of worry for a patient. Uh, so we, we found that nurses knew that something was not right before the patient deterioration. We found that through uh, focus groups with the nursing uh, staff. They were telling us, yes, that case when a patient did deteriorate, I kind of knew hours before that happened that something was not right about the patient. It was maybe something in the patient's gaze, uh, the way they were talking, uh, something that they couldn't quite put their finger on, but they, they sensed that something was not right. And actually, when we looked in the psychology literature, there is a very strong body of evidence that shows that when, when people are exposed to patterns, and they get feedback on whether that pattern means that uh, something bad is going to happen, people are able to develop what is called um, pattern recognition. So 
we we thought that nursing staff were particularly well positioned to to develop this type of pattern recognition, given that they spend the most amount of time with the patient. And we thought that this could increase the accuracy of our detection and prediction. So we, this is the, the psychologist, he's a Nobel Prize winner, who uh, described most of the, um, what is known as intuitive expertise, the development of intuitive expertise. Uh, this is something that you can see in, in chess players, for example. So basically, the brain has two systems that, that it uses. Uh, the system one is that pattern recognition that most of us have developed for, for common tasks, like reading an expression in someone's face or, or doing uh, recognizing letters and reading them. That is something that our brain does automatically very fast because we have learned to do those things. It's unconscious, and we are not really aware of, of what's really going into it. very nice experiment that, that illustrates this. Um, they did MRI scans of people that were just learning how to play chess, um, like those kids over there, and then of grandmasters, like uh, over there is Gary Kasparov. And they, they looked at what kind of system they were using to, to make decisions about what play to make. They found that the kids were making decisions using system two. They were thinking really hard about what to move next, what, what the other person could, could answer with, whereas the, the grandmasters were more using system one. So grandmasters, because they had been exposed to so many uh, chess games, they had developed intuitive expertise about what was the right move. So most of the time they were just recognizing the, the, um, what was the best move based on their pattern recognition. And that, that works really well sometimes uh, when, when you have to detect something that is oftentimes looks, looks similar. Um, so to develop this intuitive expertise, what you need is repeated exposure to, to the same patterns, intentional training and feedback. And this is exactly what nursing staff are doing when they're, when they're looking after patients. So we developed the worry factor score, which is a very simple five item scale that rates the concern for the nursing, of the nursing staff for each specific patient. Zero being, I'm not concerned about the patient. One is, I don't think anything is actively going on with the patient at this moment, but the patient is at a higher risk for deterioration because they have uh, maybe comorbidities or maybe they're older. And then two to four are increasing levels of concern for a patient where the nurse thinks something is actively going on with the patient. Maybe number two, they're not completely sure or they don't think it's, it's uh, very severe, but then number four means I think the patient is crashing right now and we need help uh, in, the next, in the next minute. So we tested the accuracy of this and we found that 70% um, of the time, 78% uh, of the time actually was the average, of the times when nurses were identifying a patient as deteriorating uh, with, uh, with a factor score of three or, or a factor score of two, but they also call the provider, uh, about 78% of those times, the patient was actually deteriorating based on, based on retrospective reviews by, by physicians and experienced nurses. And this, this was dependent a bit on the number of years of experience of the nurse, as you would expect. Nurses with less than one year of experience um, had a lower accuracy when detecting that, and nurses just after one year of experience, they were already at their, at their top uh, in terms of detecting the deteriorating patients. So this told us that this was a very important variable that we needed to include in our model. Uh, so that's what we did. Here we can see the accuracy of our score without the worry factor. So remember this, this graph shows sensitivity. You want it to be as high as possible. And on the, on the y-axis, it's the number of alerts. You want to be that as low as possible. So you want to be on the lower uh, right quadrant there. So you can see that when you add the worry factor, you go from the blue line that you get with all the, all the fancy predictive analytics and the machine learning, you go down a significant amount to the, to the green line. And that was something that we could actually implement. Um, so basically what, what we're trying to do is to detect something that is a very rare uh, incident, which is uh, an incident of acute patient deterioration for hospitalized patients. 
and you have to accept a certain number of false alerts. But the thing is, if you're using a score that is very accurate, you, you can generate a lower number of false alerts so that you're fishing more of your deteriorating patients uh, while generating less, a uh, lower number of false alerts. Um, so now we, we were thinking about how to implement this. Okay, we have a very accurate way to detect when a patient is deteriorating, much better than anything that, was, that had previously been, been developed. But now, how do we operationalize it? How do we get that information to the right people at the right time? So uh, there were, there were a, a bunch of design decisions that we needed to use. The first one, of course, was if you're going to be using an automated, an automated alert system, uh, what score are you going to use for that? Um, then the next decision was, do you really want an automated alert system, or do you want just to show the patient risk score in a, in a dashboard type so that the, the providers can, can go up and look the patients up, but they won't be actively contacted when the, when the system detects that a patient might be deteriorating. Uh, then, regardless of what you do, do you mandate a bedside assessment? Do you, do you require that the physician that is responding to the alert has to go to the bedside to take care of the patient? And then there are some ups and downs with, with that. And then after the, the provider or the physician has uh, taken care of that patient and evaluated them and maybe started some interventions, do you automate a follow-up prompt? Uh, do you send maybe another alert or maybe show something else on the, on the dashboard if that's the way you, you want to go, uh, showing, hey, this patient deteriorated two hours ago, maybe you want to check whether your interventions have worked. Uh, and then, Another, another concept that is important is the automated escalation. Uh, and here, escalation refers to escalation of expertise. So typically, the, the, the healthcare setting and, and in the hospitals, there is a hierarchy of expertise. The, the, um, the nurse is taking care of the patient very closely and, and almost all the time. And then there's, there's the next level who are the NPs, PAs, or residents that take care of that first instance of of patient deterioration, they're the first responders. Um, and then there is always a consultant um, uh, supervising that less experienced staff. So do you want to include the fact that a, a consultant needs to be contacted? Uh, consultant is, is faculty, uh, that's the consultant is the way we call them at Mayo. Um, faculty or a senior physician, do you force that as a, as a system design uh, characteristic, do you have the system actively contact the, the, the consultant or do you leave that to the, to the uh, for people to make the decision of whether they want to contact them or not? So in what score to use, there's mainly two variables that need to be taken into account. One is the accuracy, uh, the positive predictive value, which is related to the number of false alerts that you're going to generate, and sensitivity. And then another, another aspect of it is the transparency. So our score is very accurate, but one of the, one of the things that we've heard from, from providers that are using it is that they, they don't know what's causing the, the, the patient deterioration. They just know that they're getting an alert that their patient is at a high risk, and then they go and, and have to look at the patient and figure it out themselves. This, has, this is a double-edged sword. Uh, so on the one hand, and something that is, that is a bit frustrating for, for providers sometimes is that they cannot rapidly dismiss uh, a case of potential deterioration because maybe they know that, okay, this is triggering because the, the heart rate is high and then the blood pressure is low, but, but this is their, their baseline for this patient, so this is not an instance of, uh, of patient deterioration. Without score, that's not so easy to do. They, they cannot so easily dismiss the, the false alerts that are generated. But this has the upside that it forces providers, when they go to assess a patient at the bedside, it forces them to come in with a, with a, a clear mind and, and look at all aspects of the patient and, and look at all things that could be deteriorating about that patient. The next decision that I mentioned was the push versus pull system. So clearly a push system seems the most desirable because it will get to uh, to physicians 
very early on and, and in a much more timely fashion. A poll system um, has a disadvantage that maybe the physician will not get to see that uh, alert or, or that a marker that a, that a patient is deteriorating until later, but it's, of course, uh, less intrusive. It's not going to interrupt a physician maybe when he's taking care of, of some other patient, and it's not going to be felt as, as, uh, as an additional workload. It's just going to be passively there waiting for, for the providers to, to query that information. We decided to go with a push system because we, we really thought that this was accurate enough that we could be generating alerts. And because we were generating few false alerts, the, the timeliness of, of, the, of the push system was, was more important. Um, next thing was the, the mandated bedside assessment. So again, this is, this is again a balance between how intrusive or, or how uh, proactive you want the providers to, to be, but also that, that is going to increase the workload because if they're, if they're busy, you are forcing them to, or you're requiring, there's no way for you to force them, but you're requiring them to go to the bedside to assess the patient. Um, we decided, as you know, to go with, uh, with, um, with, the, with the active alerting. And the same thing for the follow-up. So two hours after the, the deterioration was detected, if the patient's score was still high, meaning that the patient was still at a high risk, we send an active alert uh, using the, our pager system to the, to the provider that had received that first alert, telling them, hey, that patient that you intervened on or assessed two hours earlier is still at risk based on, based on our risk model. So you, maybe you want to go and check on that patient. Um, this is what I mentioned. We, we, we were requiring the physicians to go and assess the patient at the bedside. And this is also related to what I mentioned earlier about uh, pattern recognition. It's, there is a lot of information that, that providers get from looking at a patient in person uh, that is just not captured in the, in the EMR. So we wanted them to, to go and look at the patient because often, oftentimes there's decision-making change. Uh, there's the follow-up that I, that I mentioned. And then the escalation piece. So as I mentioned earlier, there's different levels of expertise when in, in the team that is taking care of the patient. So one option would have been to leave the escalation at the provider discretion. So leave the resident, the, the junior physician, to decide, do I need my consultant here? Do I need my, my more senior physician here or not? And the problem with that is that there is the incentive system is, is complex there because the the residents oftentimes are scared of contacting them, their, their senior because they're supposed to be learning. So um, we really thought that it was important for the system to automate that alert so that the resident, on, on the one hand, knew that the consultant or the senior provider was going to be contacted. Um, so they, that also provided an, an incentive so they, they couldn't ignore the, the alarm even if they, even if they were busy. And, and also, it involved the consultant regardless of, of anyone's decision. So it made it, made it easy for, for the consultant to be involved. Um, so this summarizes all the decisions that we had to make. And, and again, some other hospital systems have made different decisions on this, but uh, the ones that we made are, are on green here, and the, the other option is on, on red on this graph. So the way our, our system currently works is the system um, is constantly calculating the risk score for every patient that we're monitoring. And currently, we're, we're running a pilot. Uh, we, we just finished a pilot. Currently, we're running on, on four units, two medical units, two surgical units. It's constantly calculating the risk for, for all of those patients. And if the risk score is low, meaning the patient is not at risk, it just keeps calculating it. And then if the patient is considered to be at risk, then we go through the alert uh, protocol that I will, I will describe in a minute. Um, Santiago, so I just want to give you a heads up that we want to be able to do some reacting, you know, at about quarter after 
to maybe 17 minutes after the hour, just to give you a heads up. And I know Gene wants to kind of con conclude right after you, too. Perfect. Yeah, I'm, I'm just finishing. Um, five, ten minutes, I, I think I should be done. So this is the way our alerting system works. First, it sends an alert to the nurse. Uh, that is that first yellow uh, box there. And the idea is that the nurse can go and refresh the vital signs and enter a fresh uh, worry factor. Uh, oftentimes, we're calculating this based on, based on the latest available data, but it may be a couple of hours old. Then if after that the system still considers that the patient is at risk, we send an alert to the service. And we give that service two hours to improve the patient's condition, to, to re, uh, reduce the patient risk score. And if that doesn't happen, we send a reminder um, telling them to, to check back on the patient again. One hour after that is when we involve the consultant. And at any time that we send an alert, we also page the, all the people that we, that we paged before so that they, they know what's going on and they're, they're included in the loop. Um, so this design reacts uh, directly to the failure modes and effect analysis that Dr. Halston mentioned at the beginning. So because we found that, that um, one of the failure modes was, was that the clinical condition was not reassessed, was, that was the reason why we included the two-hour uh, alert after the initial, the initial alert. Um, because people were uh, attributing that one of the one of the failure modes was uh, attributing it to the wrong cause, we included the automated alert to the consultant so that a more senior person could could look at, at the patient status. And uh, similar thing with the with the post system because uh, we found that that people were failing to recognize subtle changes. So we tested this alert system in the simulation center. We got some feedback. To, to uh, refine the way we were doing the alerts, and we, we learned quite a lot from that. And then we run a pilot uh, in four units, two medical units, two surgical units, and I'm going to quickly show you the, the results from that. So these are the, uh, it's four units. So we started in one of the medical units, then we went on to two surgical units, and, and then the last medical unit. And then we were monitoring, passively monitoring without sending any alerts, also control units. To, to be able to compare the, the effects. So the main outcomes that we were looking at, uh, because this is a rare event, we don't have um, a lot of N for, to look at mortality yet, uh, but we did look at the timeliness of the intervention. So we wanted to look at the time that it took for uh, providers to be involved, and then the time it took for providers to, to start treatment. So we saw a 40% decrease in the time until uh, any intervention or any engagement from, from the providers. Um, and that is uh, obviously a, a very significant, a very meaningful reduction in time that, is, that can be key in, in serious conditions like sepsis. We know that for every hour that we delay treatment in sepsis, there is an 8% mortality increase. Um, and obviously in the control units, we didn't see any change because we were not doing any interventions. Uh, this, this difference was uh, similar in the medical and surgical units. Uh, and then the time to therapy was, was also decreased about 47%, uh, which is about 50 minutes. So as I mentioned before, in the case of sepsis, this can reduce the mortality risk for, for a specific patient about 8%. Uh, obviously, the cases of sepsis are not that, uh, that numerous, so during our pilot, we, we couldn't, we didn't We also looked at whether we were increasing the, the number of ICU transfers, and the, we didn't really see a significant increase or decrease in the number of ICU transfers. We did see a reduction in the time it took for the ICU transfers that did happen. Uh, and same thing with the number of RT calls. Basically, the, our units were, were tracking the control units. So the changes that, that happened were, were not due to our intervention. So there were basically no changes, no significant changes in the, in the number of RT calls as well. Uh, so currently, um, currently Mayo is evaluating how best to diffuse this this model to, to the, the rest of the hospital. 
so that uh, that concludes my part of the presentation. So I'll I'll uh, give it back to Dr. Dunham. So Jean, pick it up from there, and uh, and I know our audience is really interested in how they can apply what you've learned through the mortality reviews, and uh, you know what practically they can really get after. Jean, are you, there? Are you on mute? Muted. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Santiago, for going through the scientific and engineering approach. Uh, as an audience, you can tell that we were very, um, we went through a step-by-step -step methodical approach, and a lot of that spoke to the culture that we were trying to change and the things that we had to do. I mean, we had to go through 27 committees just to get approval to do what, to implement what Santiago described to you. So. Um, there may be an opportunity in the future to talk about the organizational learning, the, ph the philosophies, politics, and change management approach, actually implementing a house-wide early warning system with a reactor arm to it that, that may be interesting to folks. But what you can see is as he went through, we went through the, the mouse traps, lost a couple of appendages around the way, but we had to address each and every component of the very multifaceted problem that we were dealing with. And in order to do that, we had to deal with physicians and nurses not communicating. So we had to bring the doctor to the bedside. We had to be able to alert people because they told us there were too many things to do in too short a period of time. As a result, we had to give them the information so they could prioritize what they had on their list. So each one of these different components that Santiago talked about was very intentionally designed to meet the failure modes that the practice told us they had. And the way we did the implementation by having a first responder and second responder in a tiered approach was to allow each and every hospital to be able to implement differently because they all have different staff and they all have different cultures. Not everyone has residents, not everyone has nurse practitioners. So it's a flexible approach that forced escalation because one of our big failure modes that didn't show up on the list but we found during mortality reviews that we weren't escalating that 27 hours that that poor uh, bone marrow transplant patient sat on the floor, the patient with the abdominal sepsis and the total abdominal hysterectomy, each and every one of those cases were a result of the junior physicians not escalating to a higher level of clinical expertise or a hospital medicine doc not escalating to a specialist. So escalation became crucial and so we had to put that time limited piece on. A very honest answer as to why two hours or three hours for that first tier, because if we were missing sepsis, we had to get the right person there to do the differential diagnosis and treat it so we could get the sepsis bundle taken care of. So yes, we were also partially driven by our government. So there was just a lot of information there, and I thank all of you for, for listening to it. And I did want to circle back to mortality review and what other people are learning. So we've got this growing collaborative of U.S., Australian, and now we've had our first Canadian site join. So we have an international collaborative that's implementing the mortality review framework developed at Mayo and um, sort of improved by all of these other sites to integrate organizational learning with quality improvement and research and move away from peer review into a system, safety learning system. And our sites, these are the 2016 sites. These are the ones who are joining us in 2017. And this is from one of our collaborators at Sharp who spoke at one of these uh, webinars recently with her apple tree, which I just absolutely love. And you can see from their five hospitals that are participating that they ran into rapid response team-related issues, recognizing subtle signs of deterioration, teaching people how to think systematically, and Mr. Delay diagnoses of sepsis and other things, getting to keep teamwork, chain of command, and escalation at the very sweet fruit top of their tree. All those things that we had to deal with as we went through. And so this is not just a Mayo issue. This is an issue that our other sites and collaborators are facing as well, and you may be facing them too. I would invite you to join us. If you're interested in joining our collaborative, we can help you diagnose and treat these failure to rescue opportunities for improvement to find them, figure out what's going on, do your failure modes analysis with you if you would so like, because we sincerely believe that no one, not patients, family members, nurses, or doctors, should ever suffer or die as a result of our process and system failures, which is ultimately what is contributing to these failure to rescue deaths. Thank you, Chuck.
thank you so much, Gene. And um, I know that uh, that Greg uh, uh, Boats uh, now is uh, uh, is with us, and uh, as many of you have uh, have heard, Dr. Boats has been uh, 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 just a stalwart champion of patient safety over many years. He of uh, anesthesia and critical care at the University of Texas MD Anderson uh, Cancer Center. He also has an adjunct appointment at uh, the at, at, at Stanford and uh, uh, will go on his time off to Stanford to help train the residents and nurses and contribute there as a faculty member. Um, he's also uh, the medical director for the uh, police department at MD Anderson and uh, working on some amazingly collaborative and powerful uh, uh, work in the area of threat safety science. Uh, he also has a fellowship. He's fellowship trained in simulation. So as a critical care doc, and from what you've heard, and I know, uh, Greg, you're a great champion of the mortality reviews, uh, what questions do you have to ask of, uh, or comments uh, for Gene and Santiago? Well, I am so excited to hear this uh, presentation because about 15 years ago when I became involved in in patient safety, uh, this is exactly what uh, what we were facing, the failure to rescue uh, paradigm in our healthcare systems led to many patients coming to the ICU with well-established organ system failure that was very difficult to treat or reverse. And my first involvement in this effort was putting in place a rapid response team to help us to identify the at-risk patient and intervene early when it's easier to reverse these uh, organ system dysfunction problems. Um, the problem that we have now is that our rapid response teams have become the fabric of our institutions now, and they're part of the problem. Um, they're still fantastic people doing fantastic work, um, but they're, they're the usual uh, uh, status quo uh, in the institutions now, and I think that finally I'm seeing, and I'm so excited to see the healthcare systems engineering approach that hardwires the work that these people are doing uh, into what we what we can do to better detect and 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 prompt people to do the right thing for our patients, especially when these things are happening in the midst of a very busy clinical schedule, when the patient who is showing signs of deterioration may not be as sick as some of the sickest patients on the floor, but their change in vital signs or change in, in, uh, in status is slowly but surely leading to a, a point where they're going to go off the edge and end up in an ICU or end up in a cardiac arrest event. Um, I think this is essential for our healthcare systems to implement these uh, these systems uh, that allow us to uh, not rely on humans to detect um, the uh, the signs of deterioration, but in fact um, use the uh, leverage the electronic uh, health records and the incredible uh, we, we call it the gut feeling of our nursing staff who may not be able to make the final diagnosis but they have enough experience to know that things are not going the way they should and to to raise the flag to have the additional resources come to bear to help these patients so they don't end up in the ICU or end up in in worse state this is fantastic work i really look forward to seeing how this is implemented in your next group of of hospitals and to see how it evolves into the way that we change the healthcare delivery system to make it much more of a systematic and safe approach to care for our patients. So great, great, great again. I want to come back to you again. Uh, uh, and um, but uh, uh, what I'd like to do is draw everyone's attention to the survey questions. So now you've really seen the engineering side of and the analytical side of what Mayo Clinic has done to implement this uh, uh, approach. And the question is, and uh, especially if you'd like to hear more on uh, people's successes, challenges, and, and, and the rest with their, their um, rapid response teams, and you want more detail on failure to rescue, please respond to this survey and give us a scale 1 to 10. 10 is very strongly agree that you want more. And, uh, and what you want, put in the free text entry. So that's uh, the first question. The second uh, uh, question is, um, uh, and it looks like we have a duplicate slide there, uh, uh, on slides 117, um, uh, you see, and the next question would be, I am interested in triage performance improvement 
topics. And uh, Gene, I'd like to, as we just set up this uh, th- this issue, y- you have implemented some major changes in triage, and bef- we'll come back to the the other topic. But while we have uh, this survey question up, uh, can you give us some highlights of what you learned about triage on the inbound patients? Sure. We were seeing issues in our mortality reviews with both direct admission patients, so those coming from outside facilities, whether they're Mayo or not, into our medical floors or into our ICUs. We were seeing issues with people triaging out of the PACU to the floors as well as from the emergency department into our general care floors. Each had a slightly different pattern of recognition-related issues, but there were patterns. And as a result, we were able, based on what we were seeing and what we learned through mortality review, we were able to implement what we now call our admission triage center. And that staff 24-7 by Way and others involved, and we all sit in one big room that's sort of like the nervous nerve center of our hospital. And so I'd be happy to go through that. But we've gone from having roughly 10 deaths a month related to triage errors to less than one a year. And every time that has happened, it's been a patient whose whose triage was rounded around our admission triage center and actually didn't go through the process. Great. It- so then coming back to both the triage and failure to rescue, uh, you know, we know that we have finance people on uh, on our calls. We have a really great cross-functional, multidisciplinary sort of representation in our research test bed. We've got some CFOs. We've got a bunch of COOs. We've got, uh, uh, you know, heads of departments. Uh, from a financial standpoint, to be able to kind of give some some hope to our risk managers um, in, wrong, in wrongful deaths, about lawsuits, malpractice suits, and other costs, have you been able to kind of monetize the benefit of the research of the mortality reviews as they relate to failure to rescue and as they relate to triage? And I would also add to that list the later misdiagnosis, which ultimately does become failure to rescue if it's not picked up. Um, our lawyers haven't given me a number. They won't give me a number. Um, but they have been able to tell, tell me that there has been a significant reduction in our wrongful death suits since we've attacked some of the patterns of process and system failures that were causing death that no longer are. And have you been seeing the same in those that have been collaborating with you over time? Yes. Um, some of the hospitals that I've worked with historically, um, one hospital in particular that's publishing their work now out of Canada, it's been doing it since 2005 when I started working with them, are seeing significant improvements in everything from sepsis to delirium to uh, triage, et cetera, as they work at the patterns, the process and system failures that they're identifying and the opportunities for improvement that they see in their own systems. Great. And then, Greg, do you have uh, questions of Gene uh, that, that you think, you know, you, you are constantly circulating with people that are trying to improve. What are the questions might you have? And then I'm going to ask uh, folks to post their questions uh, in the moments that we have uh, remaining. If you have questions, please insert, uh, go to the right lower quadrant of your, uh, of your screen. You click on Q&A up, at the, up on the uh, menu and then uh, submit your question. And uh, and then uh, we'd love to have uh, have uh, Gene answer them. And Gene, they'll pop up to your lower right hand corner. I think the first question you sort of answered, and that is, how do we get involved? Because I think this is something that is so powerful that we can implement in our own institutions. Um, sort of a corollary to that, Gene, is um, how do we as clinicians um, encourage and engage our quality leaders and our C-suite leaders to, se- to show them that this is such a valuable exercise because although um, they all believe in patient safety and quality improvement, sometimes they look at how much is this going to cost me or what is this going to do to my brand recognition in making decisions about whether to implement these programs. In terms of brand, uh, you can imagine when we first started doing the mortality reviews and telling the stories of the people who died within our, our walls, that risk was involved, uh, center and accounted for at every meeting. And even one of, one of our hospitals is in a state that does not have peer review protection statute. And our legal department stood up and said, we'll defend you any day 
as long as you're making improvements. And so we're learning so we can make improvements. And so they've had our backs from, from the very, very beginning. And so I think that makes our brand stronger because we're willing to publicly stand up and say, we're not perfect and we're going to make it better. Two, in terms of C-suite, um, Greg, you'd laugh, but you can't imagine how many times I've been heckled out of a room because I came with data and the docs destroyed the data. Or the times I went in with a story and Huddleston uh, got laughed out because she was just telling more patient stories and anecdotes. So I don't walk into a single room now with leadership without data and stories together so intertwined that A, I'm hitting all of the adult learning theories, so pictures, data, audio and visual, so I get all of the learning styles, and I'm there to passionately inspire and influence them to make the right decisions to improve things, because their plates are so full, macro, MIPS, everything we've got coming down the line. I don't know where my idea is going to fall in their priorities, but I don't stand a chance of getting it on the list unless I can inspire and influence them with data and stories, and so I walk in with a very armed deck of those things, and it's just been a, a years of learning how to pull the safety and mortality-related information together in a way that they can hear me. It's not what I'm saying. It's whether or not they can hear me that matters. And so I've worked very closely with them to try to figure out how to put that stuff together, and it's made a difference. So, Gene, because we have another minute here, uh, please tell us, uh, now, some, some people are saying, w w will you be able to share your mortality review document? And I just want to draw everybody's attention to go on our website, and you can skim down, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, off of the top menu and identify the webinars where uh, Gene has spoken. And, Kyle, please, let's put a link to every one of the prior times that she's spoken on mortality reviews for the people that are interested and haven't seen the prior ones so they can get all the slides. Uh, but the, the other uh, uh, question for you, Gene, is, um, uh, and, and can you frame what it is to join the collaborative that your data your data remains yours. You're not sharing your dirty laundry with anyone else, and only you all are the ones that can re that are helping them synthesize the data. Can you talk about the checks and balances and, and the risk and, and reward of being in the collaborative? Because I think it's a really unique opportunity, and it's at very low risk. So from a collaborative perspective, people are joining and they're reviewing 100 cases. Um, I go on site and teach reviewers how to do it the way that we've learned over five to seven years. It took us to figure out how to do the reviews and how to talk about them together in a multidisciplinary way that includes nurses through every type of physician you can imagine. And the information is HIPAA protected and it uh, resides with each hospital has its own data set. And nobody else can see it. I can't see it unless given permission. And we do some benchmarking. We do sharing of stories. We talk. We figure out how to implement together. Every hospital has had difficulty getting enough nurses involved. So how do we as a group do that? We're all finding failure to rescue things. How do we as a group begin to figure out how to move towards those things? Um, so it's a very... Uh, respectful process of organizational culture and data which allows uh, group organizational learning and allows the individual sites that join to sort of leapfrog what may, it, it took us a decade ultimately, um, hopefully leapfrog you five to seven years further ahead than, than you won't have to go through some of the pains that we did as we were growing our related process. Jean and Santiago, I want to give you a, a second to the last word, and then and Jennifer to close us if she's still with us. I know she wasn't feeling very well, but um, uh, just reading some of the questions, uh, the concept of the Rothman Index, are you familiar with that, Jean? Yes, I am. Um, there are a group of engineers in Florida whose uh, mother had a, a health-related issue, and they started their company. Um, because it's a commercialized entity, we weren't unable to understand what they've done. I don't... Um a little bit more clinically relevant because we knew how tough the implementation was going to be. And we also opted to push the information to the docs so they didn't have to seek it. And the Rothman Index has a much more uh, dashboard display uh, for patients. So we, we, because of our failure modes, had to go a different direction. Uh, so I'm familiar with it. I've read their papers. But it didn't fit our hospital. 
Great, great. And, uh, Gene, we would love to have someone come back and talk to us about the uh, misdiagnosis and, tri and triage because, the, you know, you can tell the just strong response we got from our surveys. Santiago, any, any concluding? Thank you, Santiago, for giving us the engineering background to, and, and the meat behind uh, uh, putting the alerts together. Really, really fascinating work and enlightening. Uh, any concluding comments you want to make? And then we'll go to Gene and then we will close. And I'd like to keep the speakers on just for a minute to do a, a rapid cycle improvement loop. So, Santiago, any other comments? Thank you so much. Perfect, yeah. Thank you so much for, for having me here. Um, and thanks for the, the reactors. It was a uh, great insight. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's it. I think one thing that I would, that I would um, kind of a parting thought from, from my end is that when people are considering to implement an early warning score, it's important to focus on how accurate it is uh, and kind of think about that, uh, that balance between, between accuracy and, and transparency, think where, uh, where their institution uh, is best. About the Rodman Index, it is, um, it is a, a very good score and that is uh, much more accurate than, the, than the, the other more simple ones. Um, so yeah, it's, it's great work that they're Thank doing. You. Great, and you know, I'm going to interrupt myself with uh, what I with my close. Greg, uh, this issue of opioid overdoses is, is absolutely a catastrophic ep uh, epidemic. Can you just make a comment about the combined uh, medications with the diazepam? Well, I think we're seeing um, uh, in the explosion of opioid overdoses that we're seeing across the United States, we're seeing an increasing uh, number of, of people who are uh, using polypharmacy, especially to manage some of their symptoms. Remember, most of the, uh, the people who overdose on these medications are chronic users who are trying to stay well rather than get a high. And they happen to get a batch of drug that might have either fentanyl or a higher concentration of, of uh, the opioids in them. And the benzodiazepines are often taken to mitigate some of those uh, withdrawal symptoms. But we know that the combination of benzodiazepines and opiates can be very synergistic in causing respiratory depression. And so the uh, chances of having an accidental overdose when using combinations is uh, exceedingly high when used together. Great, thanks. And I know we'll be coming back to that uh, in future webinars. Jennifer, do you have uh, some closing thoughts for us or are you still with us? Yes, thanks, Dr. Denham. I'm here. I, this has been a really great webinar, and I'm really grateful to all of you for our physician speakers and all of the hard work that you're doing with regard to failure to rescue. I only wish uh, things like this were in place 20, over 20 years ago because I think maybe I wouldn't have lost my mom. So, again, I want to thank you and keep up your great work. And all I can say is everyone on this call listening, um, this is a very, very important issue to patients and families. And thank you so much. Have a great week. And again, I encourage you to share this webinar with your colleagues. Thank you, Dr. Denham. I'll hand it back to you. Great. And thank you, Jean, for bringing Santiago to us, and Santiago and Greg for sharing your time with us. We really appreciate it. God bless all of you, and we hope you have a great month. Thank you. Thank you.